The time period between the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC and the fall of Cleopatra in 31 BC is known as the Hellenistic period, a time when the old Greek city-states gave way to big kingdoms ruled by all-powerful kings. This was a time of immense economic development for the Greeks, but also a time of strife and great wars which cost the Hellenics all of their hard-fought prosperity and eventually their independence. Greek coins of the Hellenistic period are by far the most numerous and easiest to collect. They are loaded with political imagery and their art is this super interesting mix between the classical art style of previous centuries with the added flavor of this propaganda machine from the successor kingdoms after Alexander. So today I brought you a series of lovely Hellenistic silver coins. Let's explore the main features of Hellenistic art, how it evolved from previous art styles, and with this knowledge, let's look at our coins, try to read their messages, and understand why they look the way they look. So let's get started. If we take a step back into the classical period of Greece, that is between the 6th and 4th centuries BC, Greek art developed in the naturalistic style that made it famous, with a high degree of attention to human proportions, to the proper representation of the shape of body parts, like the volume of muscles, the volume and texture of hair, the correct representation of fabrics and clothing, in an attempt to manifest in a material form what was considered the ideal human shape by the Greeks. A great example of what classical style looks like is the sculpture called the disc thrower, the discobolos. This statue shows a young athlete throwing a disc. Athletes were often used as models in the classical period for their physique, obviously. It approached what the Greeks considered the ideal human shape. They also admired their perfect form when performing a task fruit of years of training and hard work. The Greeks saw athletic excellence not only as a virtue of expressing one's body to its maximum potential, but they connected this idea to the very humanness of being. Athletics for them was never divorced from who they were as a people. Athletics was molded to all things of, I mean, all things of being Greek, to be excellent, to be excellent as a human being, to be excellent in all things, in intellectual, in physical, in everything you did, you were supposed to be excellent. The Greeks even had a specific word for it, arete, excellence, to strive for being equal to the gods. The main type of political organization during the classical period, the city-state, used sculptures extensively to embellish its public spaces, especially the temples. Certain new sculpture techniques developed in the classical period allowed representations of the human body in new, different poses that couldn't be made in previous periods. The triangular pediment on top of the Parthenon, for example, was completely filled with sculptures in different poses, while at the center, an area with plenty of space, we have standing figures occupying as much space as possible in new extravagant poses, at the very ends of the triangular shape, an area where a standing figure wouldn't fit, we have statues such as the reclining Dionysus, filling small gaps in the facade and giving the overall structure a majestic, full look. And at first impression, the later Hellenistic style might look very similar, if not identical, to the classical style. The quality of the human shape is still there, the proportions are right, the musculature, the volume of all elements on a scene are all com uh, correctly represented, but while the classical style was, in a way, the realm of the divine, with characters mostly shown in a dignified, undisturbed expression, you know, bodies in perfect shape, undisturbed by age or deformities, as if sculpture was an exclusivity reserved for the gods, in the Hellenistic style, we see, we see the innovation of 
Well, every, the scenes start having human attributes, including our imperfections and our emotions as humans. Let me illustrate what I mean. Have a look at this example. This is the Galatian suicide. The original statue was made in the Greek city of Pergamon as a celebration of a military victory of the Greeks over the Galatians. It features a Celtic warrior stabbing himself with his sword while he holds the lifeless body of his wife. Both the warrior and his wife are well within the standards of beauty for the time, but instead of the godlike perfection of the Discobulus, here we have a human scene of suffering, which in a way spoils the beauty of the couple. The woman is falling to the ground despite her being gorgeous. She's shown in this humiliating pose, the kind of humiliation that only war and the human condition could bring. The Galatian also has the same athletic body of the Discobolus, but he's laying it all to waste by committing suicide. With one arm, he precariously holds the body of his wife. One last attempt of giving her some dignity. He won't let her fall flat on her face. He at least tries laying her body gently on the ground, conveying that, that idea of excellence, in this case, excellence of character, even in their most desperate moments. He covers his face in shame with the other arm that holds the sword. How ironic, right? A sculpture that was made to be looked at, to be admired, covering itself in shame. And if you go around the statue and you manage to look at his face, you will come across his desperate expression, looking upwards to the gods, accepting his disgrace and asking for help from the divine, as all earthly fortunes seem to have abandoned him. This style was greatly criticized at the time for breaking with the depictions of idealized virtue that the Greeks liked so much. You were supposed to be absolutely perfect, and instead you replaced it with something as mundane as and ugly as humans being humans? So, okay, now that we've seen the differences between classical and the later Hellenistic art, let's look at our coins and try to understand the message they are sending and the style that they belong to. And we start with a tetadrachma struck by the father of Alexander the Great, Philip II of Macedon. His coins are very interesting. I would say they show a transitional iconography from classical to Hellenistic. This piece was struck between 335 and 349 BC at the city of Amphipolis. The obverse of this coin is clearly of classical style, no doubt about it. We have a wonderful depiction of the god Zeus with his flawless beard and wearing a lovely laurel crown. He looks forward with a dignified, undisturbed expression. One of the main traits of Hellenistic coinage is a very overt political message on coin designs. While on classical coins, political messages were sent in, they were still sent in coins, but they were sent in a subtle tone. While the Hellenistic kings were some of the biggest patrons of arts of their time, so their coinage was much more direct in its message. Here in this reverse, we have Philip riding his horse. His horses won the Olympic races in multiple occasions, and this reverse celebrates his prized animals, triumphantly parading with Philip on its back. Despite this coin being from before the Hellenistic period, Philip was already king of a unified Macedonia, so we could say this coin was a preview of what this political coin art would look like in the next few centuries. Next, we go to a tetadrachma struck under his son, Alexander the Great. Some people say this image of Heracles we see here is actually Alexander. I'm more inclined to the theory that this is just a representation of Heracles, the, the demigod. The image of Heracles on his coins show a clear shift in aesthetics compared to the coins of his dad. We now see something more akin to the Hellenistic style. He isn't the ideal of male beauty with perfect proportions. Heracles was half human. He was a tough guy. He had a human, imperfect, brutish side, 
which we can appreciate here. Look at his very pronounced forehead, his light, slightly annoyed expression. The other elements of the obverse, such as the lion headdress and its paws tied to, to a knot next to his neck, give the whole design a complex, almost cluttered look to it, which doesn't fit the clean, perfect classical style. On the reverse, ironically, we have a design that I personally would attribute more in line with an earlier classical style. This image of the suited Zeus isn't exactly what I would call emotional or anything highly expressive. It is here to pass a clear message, one of authority, that Alexander is the uncontested king of all the Greeks, just like Zeus is the king of all the gods. So his serene, undisturbed pose serves this purpose of passing a, a clear message of a stable and firm rule. And in case anyone didn't get the memo, we have the legends which clearly state who this coin was struck under. Alexandro, meaning of Alexander. Alright, let's keep going. Next, let's look at a coin from after Alexander. Now we are truly and fully in the Hellenistic period, both chronologically and stylistically. This coin was struck by Ptolemy I, one of Alexander's generals, who took Egypt as his own personal dominion. As I previously mentioned, Hellenistic coinage conveys political propaganda in a much more overt way, and here we have the face of a living monarch, something unheard of during the classical period. Ptolemy is shown realistically, no idealized versions of the king here, just the life lifelike image of this middle-aged king. He isn't shown in a particularly flattering way, you know, he looks kind of ugly really, but that's, that's the point of this portrait. It's supposed to show who your king was and what he looked like. On the reverse, we have another realistic image, in this case of an eagle the animal connected to Zeus, perched on top of a thunderbolt. Once more, strong political propaganda here. Power and authority. While on the legends, Ptolemaio Basileus, it goes even further if we compare it to the Alexander coin, who merely claimed the coin was of Alexander. Here we have the, the direct mention of Ptolemy as a king. Such a wonderful coin. This is one of my favorite Hellenistic designs. And since we're deep in the topic of political propaganda and coins, let's have a look at those who I think were the champions of personal propaganda in the Greek world. And these would be the Seleucids. While the previous coin of the Ptolemaic Kingdom did have a lot of political message in it, their coins generally focused on the entirety of the Ptolemaic dynasty. The coins generally only feature uh, a single person, Ptolemy I, the founder of the dynasty. Other later kings were shown in some coins, but they're generally rare. The majority of the coins of the entire dynasty uh, only showed Ptolemy, and since all of the kings were called Ptolemy, all of the coins had the same legends, Ptolemaio Basileus, of King Ptolemy, and this makes their coins a little bit less individualistic. They're not they're more towards the entire dynasty, not a single king. The Seleucids, however, were always in some sort of civil war, some sort of palace intrigue. It was a really unstable kingdom for most of its history, and as a result, their coins focus much more on personal messages, individuals, personal claims of authority, leading to a lot of variety on the busts featured on the coins and the messages on the legends are also very diverse, always changing in reaction to the newest political events. To illustrate this, let's have a look at this tetadrachma struck under Antiochus IV between 173 and 168 BC at the Seleucid capital of Antioch. On the obverse, we have the right-facing bust of Antiochus. His reign was marked by lots of wars. In good Seleucid fashion, they were really warlike. A very important one was against the Jews, as he tried to Hellenize them. The simple fact that his face is on the coin is a political statement on itself. 
A king of a multi-ethnic kingdom like the Seleucids should have been concerned with the specific cultural peculiarities of his subjects. The Greeks knew their tradition of putting the images of their kings on coins would enrage the, their Jewish subjects as they were against the depiction of graven images. Yet, he did it anyways, showing his coins were like his coins reflected his willingness to impose Hellenism over Judaism. Heading to the reverse, the pro-Greek statement gets even more explicit. Antiochus desecrated the temple at Jerusalem and converted it in, into a temple dedicated to Zeus. And that's what we see on this coin, another imposing image of a seated Zeus, probably similar to the statue that was placed in the temple, holding on his outstretched hand a winged victory, symbolizing Antiochus' military victories. The legends are quite a mouthful. They read, Basileus Antiochus of King Antiochus, Theo Epiphanos, God Manifest. We find this kind of slogan on the coins of other Hellenistic kingdoms, but never as explicit as in Seleucid coins. Instead of adopting a more tactful approach to their subjects, they really bet on just Hellenizing everyone, and this led to the alienation of many of their subjects. The Hellenistic period is generally considered to have ended in 31 BC, with the annexation of the Kingdom of Egypt by the rising Roman Empire. But instead of the Romans imposing their culture on the Greeks, the opposite happened. Greek culture, and especially its art, were heavily adopted by the Romans. Early imperial coin art is clearly influenced by the Hellenistic style, as we can see in this gold aureus struck under the first emperor, Augustus. The only real difference to a Greek coin is that this coin here was struck in Latin, but all of the visual elements, from the side portrait showing the Roman emperor to the reverse featuring Zeus, Jupiter in the case of the Romans, inside this temple, it's all very heavily drawn from Greek coinage, and this Greek legacy on Roman coins would continue for centuries. So, now I want to hear from you. Do you prefer Hellenistic coins over classical ones? Or do you prefer coins of, from other periods? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Leave a like and consider subscribing if you did. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.